So welcome, Dr. Mark Worthing. Thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. Um, now, before interviewing you, I did a bit of research and your bio on Goodreads is probably the most succinct I've ever seen. Um, it just purely says you are a science, uh, the historian of science and a senior researcher with the Lutheran Education Australia, which is very brief considering your incredible repertoire of works. Was that a choice that you made to keep it so brief or? Uh, a friend of mine, Ben Morton, did that for me because okay. I didn't want to bother you. He said, you've got to put a bio on Goodreads because there's stuff going up there about you. And I said, well, get, write one up for me, Ben, but, <laughs> but keep it simple. Keep it simple. Well, and that's what he did. Simple. And, and also a bit dated, I'm uh, now uh, working as a pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in yes. North Adelaide. And so no longer working as a researcher, which is uh, intriguingly given me a lot more time for writing. Well, that's good. So. <laughs> um, I did notice though that you are very absent from social media um, and I wanted to ask about that. Is that a choice that you've made? Uh, to a large extent, yes. I, I do have some issues with how social media is used and abused. I know it's a great tool and many people find a lot of uh, good in it, uh, but in my pastoral work I've um, worked with a lot of people who have found it uh, very oppressive mm. and we've also had some negative experiences with members of the family. and. So okay. the whole family tends to uh, a bit avoid it, but I have nothing against people using it. Yep. I wish there were more protocols and protections and sensibilities. So uh, partly it's just being an old codger that can't mm. figure out technology and partly it's uh, <laughs> uh, a, a bit of my way of protesting, hoping that people just do more talking face to face yeah. and not this anonymously saying things about people mm. um, in, from a distance in yep. taking you know, that uh, can be quite hurtful, so. Uh, mm. I have noticed that social media has become almost a, a necessary evil for writers. Um, and which many li writers don't like, because many writers are very quiet, reserved individuals who would rather just go and hole up somewhere yeah. and come <laughs> out once every year or two with a manuscript and then disappear again. But the publishers always say, and, and, and working as an editor with a publisher, is one of my jobs. We do that to I say, no, you need to have your accounts up. Yeah. You need to advertise your book. You need to have, you know, you need to have your profile up. So mm. uh, it, it is something that we in, tend to insist on. If yeah. you want people to notice you there, the first place people look when they hear of an author mm -hmm. is they check them out. Yeah. The website, they look, they look for the author's website. They try to find out more about them. Mm. So. Do you feel as though because you don't actually have an author page, that's been at all detrimental? Um, Perhaps in some ways and others not so much because I do do a lot of public speaking. I okay. go to a lot of conferences, I get invited to speak at different places and when I go um, I tend to bring books, talk about yep. them, promote them. So I do a lot of promotion through other means mm. and let people know and then if people like the books uh, or something moves them, they often put it on their blog on yeah. their website and okay. get it going and if people look me up they find links to, to buy the book and mm. purchase it, they just don't find me. Uh, on a website talking yep. about what I had for breakfast that yeah. morning, <laughs> which, is, which is probably for the best. <laughs> okay, well, um, talking about your works, uh, some of your most recent ones, we've got some here. You've got Fantasties, which was the retelling of George MacDonald's classic fantasy. Fantasties, yeah. yeah. Um, then you've got this uh, Narnia Middle Earth and the Kingdom of God which talks about fantasy literature in the Christian tradition. Which yeah, we'll talk about history. Yep. The, this one... Uh, and these are also last year. Last year's as well. Yeah. Okay, so we've got Graham Clark. So um, so that was a biography you wrote about the man Graham who invented Clark. Yes, the Graham Clark, ear. one of Australia's most famous scientists yeah. and just a, a wonderful individual, remarkable story. Uh, but had not really been told. He had written bits and pieces himself, yep. but it was very academic, very scientific. So he'd start to tell the story and pretty soon it's all in the technology uh. and what was done and people wanted to find out. But who who are these people that opposed it? What happened? How did it come to this? Yeah. And uh, so, um, yeah, he, he had turned down several offers for someone to write a story and I had asked him and made a little bit different presentation okay. and told him what I wanted to do and why I wanted to do it. 
and he went home and talked with his wife and yeah. said, okay. So I went out and, uh, and met them on wow. their home in uh, outer suburban Melbourne. And uh, that was the beginning of uh, what's well, been enduring friendship. And uh, just it was a privilege to write down his story. That's amazing. And that was, uh, yeah, and that, and that did very well. I think those books are now rather hard to find okay. because they've, uh, they didn't do print on demand, but they did a print run, I think, about 12,000. I think they pretty yeah. much disappeared except for a couple boxes I have squirreled away. Yeah. And, in a closet yeah. here. No, oh, that's fantastic. And I'm so glad that he was able to actually find someone to tell his story. Yeah, it was, yeah. It, it was, it was a real privilege. And for him, it was the right time looking for someone mm. who was not going to sensationalize, not reveal things that could embarrass other people in yeah. the story. Uh, but the biggest thing is he wants someone who would actually bring out the role that his own Christian faith played. Yeah. And as a Christian writer myself, I said, that's one of the reasons I'm fascinated by your story. Mm. Uh, is the role that your own faith played in supporting you mm. in some some very difficult times? So, uh, mm. so there there we went, and it was uh, it was a wonderful experience. But as a historian, uh, most of the people I've written about have long since passed on. Mm. So it was a unique experience writing about someone yeah. who's still living. Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult. It's got advantages because you can call them up and yeah. say so. What was actually going on That's here? Right. What, what, there's something else, what's behind this? But at the same time, you have to be very careful because you can write the story that you'd like to write and they say, oh no, I'd rather not say that. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so you respect those wishes and negotiate. So it had, it had advantages and disadvantages mm. writing about someone who was you know, alive, yeah. still alive and making sure that he and his family were all happy with the story and yet the story was told well. Mm -hmm. uh, was was different wars. Uh, so different earlier to, this year, I wrote a book uh, uh, for the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation mm -hmm. called Martin Luther, a Wild Boar in the Lord's Vineyard. Nice. And it was meant to be, uh, which is, that's a wild boar in the Lord's Vineyard are the opening words that the Pope used in his bull of excommunication wow. for Luther. Arise, O Lord, for a wild bull has entered your vineyard. And oh. it's basically running amok. So that was, uh, because he, he was, in some sense, a bit of a wild bull, or yeah. bore of a personality that's kind of uh, went through things um, very uh, brusquely sometimes. But uh, that was interesting because uh, the story had been told so many times, but the trick was to tell in a readable and engaging way to mm. modern readers. Uh, but of course, writing about someone who'd been dead for 450 years plus, um, I wasn't going to offend anyone. Mm. Uh, who was there at the time, so that was a yeah. little bit different kind of thing. And uh, What the Dog Saw is a um, different kind of book, and mm -hmm. that also came out about six, seven months ago. Yeah. Um, and that's the story of my son's struggle with mental illness and mm -hmm. his suicide, yeah. as seen through the eyes of his uh, Labrador. Wow. And it's written for young adults because what we found was he had younger, younger brother and sister, and there's just really was nothing for literature to give an adolescent to read mm. when they're struggling just in the school and their family. And yet it, it impacts thousands of adolescents every year. So I wrote the story to help young people talk about it in a way that uh, deals with the issues but is a bit more grace and a bit less confronting mm. uh, than the ordinary way. So the guide is a Labrador telling the story of this boy's struggle in life and, um, and what happened. And uh, that's, that's picked up and it's done remarkably well. I've had a few invites around the country to go and speak to different community groups and mm. other groups about this and quite a few schools and school systems have picked it up and given it to the counselors and the school pastors to have on hand. So it's starting to have some, some positive impact. Um, but that was a very different kind of biography. Yeah. So. Wow. So th this is obviously a very deep passion of yours to write and in so many different ways to, to use that gift. Um, did you always know you wanted to be a writer? I, yes, I think I, it was always a dream to write. I always loved reading. Yeah. And uh, we had very few books. I grew up in a very uh, impoverished background. Uh, my parents were migrant workers okay, in okay. the United States. Yeah. And um, so we traveled around and uh, end up settling down because of a bad year and crop failure and mm. just uh, things went from bad to, to worse. And so uh, got a piece of land they settled on, which is barely farmable, but you know, tried to get going. But we didn't have a lot, but one of the few things we had were uh, a, a few books. Yeah. So I had a few story books and there's an old Bible. And then uh, my grandparents gave me a set of old encyclopedias from the 1880s, wow. Encyclopedia Britannica, and um, 
and I had a severe speech impediment as a youth, so the, the teachers recommend I practice reading out loud as much as possible. That's so brilliant. I would read every moment I got and stay up late with the torch, you know, in the room, you know, reading under the covers and mm. I'm supposed to be sleeping. And um, I suppose through it, what developed was a love of words yeah. and the power of words in telling a story. And I always thought I'd love to write. So in high school, uh, that was my favorite part of English class was being able to write poetry and short stories. Yeah. And, uh, you know, was quite thrilled to get a few published, you know, in, 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 uh, in, in, in local publications and school publications and mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, but then, of course, the tide from return to academia and yeah. study, uh, which is a different kind of thing. But uh, once again, I thought, well, if you discover things through research, you need to write them down. You need to write them down well. Mm. So, um, so yeah. So I spent some time doing uh, mostly academic writing, but always interested in writing short stories, poetry, and reading mm. uh, things. And thought one of these days, I'm mm. going to turn to some more of this kind of writing. And I think academic writing, history of science writing, kind of turn to biography. Uh, continued to, to get the occasional short story or poem published, and. Um, then start doing a little bit more fiction writing as well. Yeah. Wow. So, so it's been um, a diversity. Some would say if I just focus on one thing, maybe I get good at it, <laughs> one no, kind of writing. I but I, I, I've enjoyed the diversity. Yeah, and a lot of people do get stuck in a certain framework. And I think it's great that you've been able to go beyond just academic writing or biography. You've actually broadened beyond that, which is really good. So yeah. I find it interesting because if you... It, it's it, one thing it has in common. Any kind of writing is really telling a story. Yeah. And whether it's uh, you know whether it's the story of the Adelaide Harriers Athletic Club, a hundred years I remember of in writing the story, or whether it's a story of God, creation, contemporary physics, God and science, which was uh, which was my first major publication, uh, or whether it's a story of looking at the Matrix movies, mm -hmm. or whether the story of Martin Luther. Or, or Graham Clark, or uh, uh, of uh, work of fiction, it's it's telling a story. Yeah. And I think some people fail to recognize this. So I'm not a writer because I just do some academic publications. Mm. I say, but you need to tell it well and make yeah. it interesting because you're telling a story. And if you don't tell it well, people aren't going to understand what you've explained. Mm. You've just got a lot of data stuck on there, kind of scrambled. Yeah. Uh, and and there seems to be that idea that if you're writing fiction. It needs to be edited. You need to have people look at it and give you advice and, and make sure it's written well and engaging. But if you're writing academic work, as long as you've got the right degree behind you and the data's all there, any old thing will do. Mm. And, and wow. I, I don't believe that's the case. So mm. whatever kind of writing you do um, should tell a story and should tell it as well and creatively as you're able to do. Awesome. So. <laughs> Um, you actually founded uh, and were the head of the Creative Writing Program at Tabor Adelaide. Yes. Um, and you're now the editor of Stone Table Books, which yes. is an Australian publisher specialising in fantasy. Fantasy and now looking at merging into sci-fi as well. Yep. Uh, based in Melbourne. I'm so not in Melbourne, but the publisher is based in Melbourne. Okay. Do you think in, in your experience, do you have you found there is such a thing as a good writer? Um, there are a lot of good writers, but I think you might be asking, is there such a thing as a naturally born good writer mm. that some people are just by nature good writers? Um, some people might have more of a gift for storytelling than others, but even then I suspect it has to do with early childhood in, mm. in listening to stories and enjoying the story and becoming a storyteller themselves. I think most children have a natural tendency to want to tell a story yeah. and tell it well, but sometimes they don't get listened to. Mm. or they don't get the proper encouragement, or they give up because it becomes too difficult. Um, so I think most of us have the storytelling ability in us, but if we nurture that and we learn how to translate their oral storytelling ability into, um, into written form, I think anyone can improve and learn to become a better writer. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure people are naturally born to be good writers, but I suppose well, what we know of the science of the brain, there's some people who probably, um, because of how they work, the more creative, the more artistic types, uh, 
tend to like to tell a story. There are people that will come in and say, sorry I'm late, uh, but you know, uh, there is a terrorist attack that I got caught up in and I'm, you know, I, and, but it's everything's okay now, let's get on with our meeting. And there are other people that come back and say, sorry I'm late, and they're told about the most trivial thing that happened on the way, but everyone's just at the edge of the seat listening to how they <laughs> describe what every person said, what they looked, what happened, the suspense of what's going to happen, how did they did they find did they find the home that this gentleman was you know was missing from and was lost and work out who he was and how they do it, and that's the trick. Some people I think, when they talk, they want to make it interesting mm. and they and they want to give the details and they've learned to do that and so maybe there is a bit of natural artistic storytelling that comes through, but it needs to be nurtured. Yeah, and it needs to be honed. I don't think uh, some writers like to give the impression they just sit down and write mm. and they're just natural geniuses um, and uh, this was uh, uh, there was a famous British poet uh, who had uh, done this and his view was he would tell people he came up with these brilliant poems and he just said he just sat down and he wrote them and because people would say can you learn this can you learn the art no you just it's a natural inborn genius and what was intriguing is uh, when he died and his papers were found, they found versions of the poems and some of them were quite horrendous to start with uh. famous poems and crossing out and rewriting and starting over. And he had spent weeks and months laboring mm -hmm. to get a final product that looked like it just flowed naturally yeah. uh, from his pen. Uh, but unfortunately, probably a lot of would-be poets were discouraged and thought, I just can't sit down and do that, so maybe yeah. I, don't, I don't have the gift, I better give up. Mm. Um, so I, I think everyone can improve mm. and, and nurture uh, their communication skills and their writing skills. And those that take the time uh, don't necessarily become successful writers, there's no guarantee of that, but you become a better writer and storyteller than you otherwise would have been. Mm. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just talk about uh, the South Australian publishing scene as um, Stone Table Books has it's only been around. And, and that's based in Melbourne. It's based in Melbourne, but, but I'm here. You're here. So this could be a very short story talking about the South Australian publishing scene, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Well, have you have you had much experience with the South Australian publish, publishing scene as a writer and as an editor? Yeah. Well, there's 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 not a lot these days, to be honest. Uh, there used to be some Christian publishing here. I think the last one to go out of business was um, Open Book Publishers, mm. uh, which is a Lutheran publishing house, and they did nonfiction and some, some fiction as well near the end. I was actually in the board of that mm -hmm. in some of the latter days, so they had went out of business. Because I think there's Wakefield Press. Uh, there's Wakefield yeah, Press that's still yeah. here, and they're probably the best known publisher based in South Australia, but uh, you know they've had some funding that they used to get regularly from the Arts Council in South okay. Australia they no longer get, so they've, they're publishing less than they used to, so it's, it's a struggle. Uh, Gin and Dare Press is based here and sometimes does some poems, very small. Uh, so there are few very small publishers. Mm. Wakefield would be the largest one and the only one that probably had um, brick and mortar kind of building to go yeah. to, I think, not operating out of someone's spare bedroom at home. So the writing scene in South Australia is healthy. A lot of very gifted writers here, mm. but most all the writers in South Australia go through publishers that are based in the eastern states or, or overseas. Uh, which is a little bit unfortunate. Mm. So the publishing scene is not that lively and it's difficult. There's a few people doing self-publishing as anywhere, but as far as formal publishing, uh, not a lot happening in South Australia. Mm. Uh, the gravitation, and, and even in Australia in general, has been struggling with, with publishing um, as the, the bigger centers in Great Britain and the US tend to be kind of dominating some of that. Have you always published with Australian publishers? No. No? No, I published a uh, uh, German publisher, um, published with, um, with a, US, a couple of US publishers, um, and I've had, I've worked consultatively with a British publisher before, and so I've, I've done a few things, uh, one even from Indonesia. Oh, wow. Uh, that was an interesting interesting story because I didn't even know I'd published the book and they asked me for a copy of something and I misunderstood the broken English and the communication until I got, you know, and so they published 2,000 copies of a book and, uh, and I just sent them a manuscript because I thought they were interested to look at it wow. and they were actually asking if they could 
publish it. Yep. Uh, but the way they put it, I'd, I'd misunderstood. They said, can, can we make this available to a few people in A5 form? I thought, well, why not? But of course, A5 form for them meant <laughs> something in this. Wow. Like, okay, so read carefully. So I've, I've had experience with a few different publishers. I've been in a few different editorial uh, boards over the years for publishers. So I've, I've gained a little bit of knowledge of how it works. And it's, um, it's a difficult world and struggle, and it's been changing rapidly, mm. uh, the publishing world. Because even 20 years ago, uh, when I was on board for open book publishers here, you know, we had a big old Heidelberg um, printing press that cost over a million dollars. Wow. And, and it was still running through, and you book something in, and you got the books, and you decide to do, it wasn't worth the effort, unless you did at least a thousand copies, and you keyed it up, and it's typeset, and you run it through in the press, and then do it. And uh, so you didn't tend to publish anything unless it's going to, in a bigger, even small publishers, want a thousand to two thousand mm -hmm. to print, and the big ones, usually five or ten yep. thousand copies before they would print them. And then they'd store them in a warehouse and sell them, and if they didn't sell them, they'd lose a lot of money. Mm. But of course, print and demand came up and um, self-publication uh, is happening and of course, uh, e-publishing and so many things are changing. And in some ways, it's hurt traditional publishers mm. and booksellers uh, and made it difficult. In other ways, it's made it easier for smaller publishers to get their foot in the door because you don't need a huge amount of startup cost. Yep. You do need some, but to be a, a serious publisher, you don't need to buy a million dollar printing press. Yeah. Uh, you can have someone do that in print on demand. And you, by print on demand, you don't need to commit to X number of thousand of books. You can, you can print out you know, 100 or 200 for initial sales, reviews, and launches, and then order them as needed. Yeah. So there's no storage in the warehouse. So suddenly, uh, we can do smaller scale publications, which makes it easier for authors starting out to get a, a, a publication mm -hmm. and a decent one out. So it's been good and bad. Yeah. And it's changing. No one quite knows where it's going to go. A few years ago, people said, don't waste your time. It's all going to be ebooks. Print is, is, is going to be dead. And mm -hmm. of course, in the last five or six years, ebooks have been going down a bit. And there's reasons for, for that. It might change. Uh, but there's been a, a persistence that people have been a bit reluctant to admit to with traditional printed hard copy mm -hmm. books. And so reluctantly, I think a lot of businesses are saying, I think we need to keep selling and stocking and doing these. Yeah and try to understand why it is that people like to have that relationship with the printed page, yeah. uh, with the e-books, uh, uh, because and I think some, there's, there's a romance to reading an old-fashioned kind of book. Uh, and it's nice as an author, it's just to kind of smell the paper. <laughs> and uh, you can seek help for that if you have trouble <laughs> swimming, uh, if, it, if it gets too much. But it's, you, can, you can just pick it up and grab it and take you with you on a holiday, on yeah. a plane. And, and read. And of course, the other thing is you can underline and mark it, and you can hand it to a friend. Yeah. Or you can put it on a shelf, and 20 years later, look it up and pull it back. Yeah. Was a lot of the ebooks people buy and say, Oh, I bought that once, but I use a different reader now, and it yeah. doesn't match up. No, I can't give it to you because it's only my e reader. Yeah. And, uh, and so I know it's, it's some people enjoy it, but it didn't quite get the same. It didn't get the momentum I think mm. people thought that's going to put the other out. So still in print and for publishers, uh, there's a lot more money to be made in print copy. Uh, most publishers, even the big publishers, lose money in ebooks because just not not that many go. I think they sold over ten thousand to Graham Clark mm. and something like fifty e copies. Wow! But they have to do them in e copy because. People say they want it, looks bad, they don't, but a lot of publishers are hoping someone else will stop first and say we're just not making these available. Yep. A lot of smaller ones don't because you still have to put the money out to get them set up in the different formats. And, some t and there's often more than one format you have to make them available in, and someone has to be paid to do that. So it's a fair bit of investment. Mm. And then people expect that they sell it for less because they don't actually have a book to hold in hand. Mm. So it, um, it's been a bit difficult, but part of that changing way that stories are told, that books are communicated, but rather than despairing, I think the enterprising new publisher or even the author needs to look and say, okay, things are changing, but when there's change, there's always opportunity. Yeah. Where is it? Mm -hmm. How can I break into this? How can I get my voice heard? Mm -hmm. How can I help get our, the books that we're selling out there mm -hmm. uh, in, in a climate in which traditional publishing has just been turned upside down in the yeah. last 20 years and continues to be in, in a bit of turmoil? Mm. Okay.
<laughs> Probably more than you wanted to know about Comprehensive answer. <laughs> um, okay, so you are a member of ISCAST. Is that yes. an acronym? Yes, it is. <laughs> and it's a complicated one. Okay. It's a group that's been around for about 40 years, and it stands for Institute for the Study of Christianity in an Age of Science and Technology. Wow. And they've now abbreviated that uh, in all the brochures to say it stands for Christians in Science. And it's an Australian-based group. There's similar groups in the U.S. and in the U.K., but it's basically Christians who work in the sciences and in technology uh, to kind of band together to get the message out that the science and, and, and Christian faith are not necessarily enemies, uh, mm. work together, so, which serves an important function um, to help people in the modern world look at Christianity a bit differently mm. and to help Christians perhaps see science a bit differently. So because of my background, one of my doctoral degrees is in the history and philosophy of science, mm. uh, and the other one's in theology. So um, because of that background, I've worked a lot with the sciences, I've done a lot with history of science, and so I've gotten involved now 25 years ago with ISCAST, I've been a fellow there, and, uh, and occasionally do books on science and faith, mm. and go and do talks. So. Uh, in a couple of days, I'll be going to Sydney to University of New South Wales to give uh, a lecture there on science and uh, faith. Uh, that's an annual lecture that's just started up mm. that's being co-sponsored by ISCAST and some other groups. So it opens some interesting doors and possibilities and something I stayed involved in and been uh, a little passionate about. Yeah. So I see you've done your research of me. On I have. I've, I've studied all the Google So my e-presence is not, is <laughs> not as minimal as I'd no, like. No, there you are. It's all those conferences. But I noticed that the patron for ISCAST is Professor Graham Clark. Yes. Um, and I was interested. He's also a member of ISCAST. And they had, I'd actually, he only recently became the patron. And um, uh, they'd wanted to ask him. They're a little bit nervous. So they asked ah. me. And they said, look, could you ask Graham if he'd be willing to be the Brilliant patron for ISCAST? Nice. So, I, so I went out. And I, I just see many how I stopped at his house. And we talked things. As, and, and I said, no, Graham, this is something to ask you. If you were approached and asked, <laughs> how, how would you respond? And he said, well, hypothetically, what would it involve? Because <laughs> been, he's been an affiliate member for, for many years, but mm -hmm. he's probably the most famous and prominent member in getting up in years. He's in his early 80s now. 80s now. We you know, didn't want to impose too much on him, but he was, he was happy to support this because he said, when I was just starting out and young, I wish as a group holding conferences, yeah. giving talks that I could have talked to and, and found people that were, you know, committed in the Christian faith, but also working actively uh, in, in the sciences. And, uh, mm. and, and it just wasn't there at that time for him. He had to kind of find people yeah. by hit and miss. But even, um, I was interested to read that he'd, re uh, he'd written some work about the intersection of science and faith. He and wrote a little booklet. Back and in, I think, 79 or 80, no. right after the first bionic, successful bionic ear transplant. Okay. And he, he was well known. He had achieved all this. He thought I'd take a little bit of break from all the research mm -hmm. on bionics. And because people would ask him a lot of questions at church to give talks, he thought he'd write down a few things. It didn't go very well. Well, there are four chapters. And three of them were very interesting, went very well. And one of the, one of the four chapters was about creation and evolution. Mm -hmm. And he thought, you know, I know a lot of people at church and friends that just don't accept evolution at all. And I know a lot of Christian friends that, that say God created through evolution. So he goes, I'm trying to write, he says, this is easy. I'll just write and try to point out positive points that both mm -hmm. groups have. And so of course, both groups completely castigated him because all they read was he's not on our side. Yeah. <laughs> he's on the other side. And he didn't expect that because he was used to a lot of flack and difficulty and everything being argued over and critiqued in the sciences and mm. he thought this would be nice the nice friendly world of religious <laughs> studies he would just oh, write wow. this little book and everyone would be happy and mm. so he said out he said i'll never write about religion and faith again i'll leave that to people who are braver than i am mm. well you've certainly dived in to the conversation yes why do you feel like it's such an important conversation to have i'm concerned about young people um going out in high school going out to university in being caught in this polarization. On the one hand, they encounter people who say, um, Christian faith doesn't make any sense, it's anti-science, it doesn't fit, it's, it's, it's all a bunch of uh, malarkey, you just need to forget it, mm. and it's quite disparaged. Uh, and on the other hand, they're encountering people in some churches saying science is bad, it's of the devil, it's the enemy, these theories, Big Bang, cosmology, that can't be, 
evolution, nothing about it can be the case, it's just all simply wrong. And, and they live in both worlds. They're people, they read their Bible, they go to church, but they're also studying, looking at things, and, and we're trying to give them a choice and say, sorry, it's gotta be one or the other. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of a number of people trying to point out that there are a lot of people who are good, solid Christians and good, active, respectable scientists uh, who live respectably in both worlds and that, that it's quite possible. Don't let yourself get caught in the polarization that says you either have to be this or that. We're either, we're either all right or they're either all right and there's no in between. Mm. And the reality is um, that there's a lot of room for conversation interface and uh, so I try to help promote that in different books. Just one reissue last week, uh, this has just come out. Uh, God and Science in Classroom in Pulpit, okay. written by Graham Buxton, Chris Mulheron, and myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, uh, it's an updated version of something that's done a few years ago from lecture series around the country. And it's advice to pastors, church workers, and teachers about how to deal with the issue of science and faith mm. uh, in, a, in a positive and constructive manner. So it's not, a, it's not an advocation saying, this is the right way, that's the right way, but here are the issues, here are some do's and don'ts, here are some things to be sensitive about. So I suppose it's a pastoral concern about young people uh, like me when I went to university that just kind of got thrown into this and thought, what's going on here? Mm. This makes sense and that makes sense. And then, and then these people tell me, no, it's our side or nothing. These people say it's our side or nothing. And I think the sciences lose a lot of good Christian young people to the sciences. And I think the churches lose a lot of good Christian people to the church because when you force the all or nothing choice, someone's gonna lose. Yeah. Uh, them and I and, I, and I think it makes a dichotomy in our brain that is not healthy for us mm. um, to think that uh, somehow God has nothing to do with the physical world around us so that we can't learn something from it and some of the things we see in the physical world do challenge us to think and say am I thinking the right way about God mm. could have possibly been like this um, so that's that's part of my passion there mm. is is uh, more of a pastor one than I suppose a, yeah. a purely academic one. So I continue to write in that area even though uh, it does bring with it a certain amount of conflict. Mm. Uh, the only death threats I've ever received have been from being involved in science and faith issues and writing about this from time to time. There'd be a group that gets upset at something I say and put something on social media encourages people to contact my employer, my boss, or me, and, mm. and, and you get that and it's, um, it's always been a bit surprising that so much passion could be generated yeah. for something and say, do you realize you completely misunderstand what the big issues are? But um, other things you would think people would be a bit more concerned about? No, no, not that, kind of, not that kind of passion. But science and faith, you can get some extreme passion. And I think the innocent victims are young people trying to find their way. Mm. And it's just nice to know that there are other voices out there that say, you know, you don't need to be torn apart by this. Yeah. I don't care if you agree with me or disagree with me, but you need to realize that whatever you decide, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, and to, to, to realize that other people might decide to look at it differently. But just keep an open mind, continue to look, be in conversation, and don't worry that if you don't come up with the right view that you're gonna lose your faith. Mm -hmm. Or that if you wanna be a Christian, that this whole range of career opportunities are out mm. of the question for yeah. you because it would involve you studying things that God doesn't agree with. That, sorry, but that's not actually mm. a biblical perspective in my view. Okay. Um, I actually wanted to ask you, you recently, um, just earlier this year, uh, attended a conference where you were talking about um, mental illness and ah. suicide and depression. Um, and I was interested in your perspective on how you think literature affects mental health or is, does it at all? Can it be valuable in mental health? Everything affects mental health. Yes, well that's because true. Because <laughs> we're, it's all the things, both positively and negatively. Yeah. So music, conversation, friendship, groups, you know, social settings, literature. Um, if, if you're struggling um, to feel positive and find a positive outlook, the right kind of books and literature can be very important. And perhaps the wrong kind can be rather distressing, yeah. but also to deal with things openly. I part of this was was something that people said, and 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 there are people. Um, a couple of publishers looked at this, mm -hmm. and we're going to do it. And then someone higher up said, "No, we can't do this. You can't write a book aimed at adolescents about suicide." But I said, 
Yeah, but unusual. people this age, people, but you know, adolescents do commit suicide in Australia. Yeah. Uh, perhaps not as high as rates as when they get into later teenage years and young adults, but also a lot of adolescents lose a mother, a father, a big brother, a big sister, someone mm -hmm. in this school setting and are confronted with it. And so because we think this is a topic that's too difficult to deal with, we're just gonna leave all those people dangling and provide mm -hmm. nothing. So I believe that we need to find positive ways to talk about things, to help people talk about the pain and, and find possibility for hope. So literature does play a big role. When, when my son took his own life five years ago, you know, we, we, we looked for, for literature to help understand. You think you understand these things until it happens to you and then you realize there's so many questions you have and you mm -hmm. wonder, has anyone actually experienced this? And what do you do about this and that? So you start looking for literature in the books and there's not much there. You look on, and then you look on the internet and a lot of what's there is, is more harm than good. Mm. Uh, and some, some very unfortunate stuff. And, and that's very difficult and quite discouraging because I, would, I looked for things that I could find to help, but people were reluctant to share this story mm. or to share honestly or to get it from a Christian perspective or the Christian perspective is always, you know, this discussion, does the suicide go straight to hell? Mm. And, and those that try to be great said, so possibly, maybe not. And others are saying, yes, yes, yes. And it has to be in these arguments on, on the internet. And I'm thinking, but wait a minute. There's nothing about this in the Bible. Where's this, where's this stuff coming from? How did it develop? So I've been doing some writing and some papers and uh, would like to eventually produce a book that's a guide for Christian counselors and workers and people who uh, experience this about how to talk to people, what's going on, biblical view of depression, of suicide, mm. of mental illness. It was some honest talk about that. So as I go to these conferences and workshops, I keep developing and working on it. But it's taking a while because it's emotionally very draining. Yeah. Because every time I do it, I have to confront uh, our own family's um, mm. struggles in, in history with this. And, and the same with this book, very hard to write. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it need to be done. And I applaud anyone who writes and gets out and speaks honestly mm. and puts things there because especially with a thing like, if you're feeling quite depressed, if you're feeling suicidal, if you're struggling with mental illness, you don't tend to go and talk openly with people. Mm. It's because you feel like no one wants to know. Uh, the whole message is don't talk about it. You know, we don't talk about suicide. So the message is to people who might be struggling with these issues is we don't want to hear about it. So you tend to look for a book yeah. or you tend to look for some things in source material on website and you start looking, seeing what's there. Uh, it's a lot of stuff that's not been well thought through, some very dated and unfortunate opinions. And um, one way to counter it is to try to help produce some, more, some better stuff, some more honest material, and things that have a bit more hope, I think, ultimately in them, and encourage other people who, you know, to find the voice and do the same. Mm. So I think it does play a role and can play a bigger role, especially in an issue like this where people don't feel comfortable just going up and ringing a friend or talking about it necessarily. Uh, people look things up, will get material out there, put it, put it on the web, uh, get, find sites with good positive stuff so people who are looking will run across and say, that's a good, oh, wait a minute, here's a site that says uh, Christian views on mental illness and suicide. And it says, oh, it's not necessarily demon possession. Oh, they're not, they're not going to, this is what's, okay, this is what the Bible says and doesn't say. Mm. And it's, um, so yes, uh, a very important sign, very passionate about and plan on doing more. In fact, one of my current projects is actually kind of grew out of this. Okay. A, a, one of my current uh, fiction mm -hmm. projects um, as well as, of course, this is, this is, this is nonfiction. Yeah. And the manual I'm writing is um, getting close to ready to go out, but I, I want to really try it. And a lot of people will bend through this to make sure um, I've not said anything that's insensitive wrong or overlooked because it's a bit it's a, it's a bit more than getting a fact wrong about you know Galileo yeah <laughs> and you're talking about this so I want to check that out so I'm hoping that those resources would soon be available my plan is when I get it published I want to also put it on the website and just make it free oh, wow. and so that's the deal I talked to the publisher and said here's what I want to do mm -hmm. I'm going to get it out and here's the people can buy it in hard copy but almost immediately I want to make an, an put on a website, make the material there, and just anyone can download it and use it. Yeah. And they've said, yeah, yeah, it's okay. So that's, that's the plan when, when that's ready. Mm. One of the things I wanted to ask you was whether you find fiction or nonfiction um, 
not necessarily easier, but do you prefer to write one or the other? Nonfiction's easier. Really? Because you don't have to put a lot of thought into it. Okay. The facts are already there. You just have to find them, research them, write them yeah. down. But so, you know, if you start out writing the life of, of Graham Clark or of Martin Luther or of the history of fantasy literature, you just, you look at the facts, you start writing about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you write fiction, when you, when, you know, like Fantasties, as uh, George MacDonald did, or a couple works I'm working on now, mm -hmm. a couple novellas, you just got this blank page. Yeah. And it could be anything, uh, because everything needs to be made up. The characters, their backstories, who they are, mm -hmm. and it, more difficult, but it's also more fun because you don't have the usual constraints and rules. Yeah. So sometimes you're writing about Martin Luther and thinking, you know it would have been really cool if he had done this? <laughs> <laughs> If, if he would have showed up at Rome and challenged the Pope to a, a, a <laughs> fist fight to settle the matter, that would have been really cool, but you just can't make that stuff up. No. <laughs> so, uh, but of course, in many stories, when you start looking, you realize what actually did happen is often more fascinating than the weird stuff that That's I would have made too, up, yeah. uh, which is certainly the case for, for Luther. And even in, in, in the case of Graham Clark as well, that as you get going, you know, you're thinking, I couldn't have made up a story this yeah. way, as, as, as these people, what actually did happen. So there is a freedom and a bit of fun in writing fiction uh, that I quite enjoy, but I also find it a bit more draining and, and mm. harder uh, in, in ways. Yeah. So what are you working on at the moment, can I ask? I'm working on um, a, a couple things. In the area of fiction, I've, in the final stages, uh, just having a few more people look at it, of doing a fantasy novella called The Winter Fay. And it's actually the main character is an 87-year-old man with dementia. Okay. And I work with a lot of dementia sufferers in, in my ministry and role, and, I've, and it's, been, it's quite a painful and difficult struggle. And I thought, why not have a book in which the main character is older and quite a bit older and struggling with this? So he's, he's starting to struggle with this. And in his youth, he was, he was lost in a forest in wintertime and was saved by a fairy. Mm -hmm. He didn't know it was a fairy, he just called her the Snow Mother, and he remembers this, but then times went past, everyone who remembers that they've forgotten, he thinks it's one other thing that he's, is, he's not trying to remember, but then he finds something, something happens, he realizes he's not imagining it, so he's in the situation of being ready to be picked up and taken into nursing care, his family said, so that's it, you can't live on your own anymore. Mm -hmm. And he decides um, to just get his walking stick and his jacket and his boots on in the middle of winter and walks out into the deep wood, into the great wood, in search of the Snow Mother. Yeah. Turns out to be the Winter Fae. Uh, and then where the story goes there and what happens and what's going on in fairy and all this time. So it's a, it's, an, it's a fantasy novella with an interesting twist because it's dealing with end-of-life issues yeah. in dementia as well as being a journey into fairy. Oh. Um, and that, that will be out um, with Stone Table Books a bit later mm -hmm. uh, in this year. Uh, another one I'm doing is uh, called Iscariot. And mm -hmm. it's a little bit, uh, it's a short novel. It's probably also a novella in a sense, but uh, either a long novella or a short novel. Um, and it's looking at uh, the life of Judas Iscariot, mm -hmm. particularly the last 10 days of his life. Okay. Um, and I got into that and looking at the story because of his suicide and mm -hmm. how it used an example. And the more I looked at that, um, the story of Judas, there's just so many things that didn't add up and didn't make sense. Mm. And so I started looking and researching to find out uh, quite a few different things and that gave a whole different um, take on the story. So the story actually starts with showing a bit of his family background, who he is in meeting Jesus mm -hmm. and, and the first several chapters. And then, and then kind of, you know, then, then they go off and, you know, the three years ministry, mostly around Galilee, and then, then comes back to the events of this last, probably about 10 days uh, that happened and try to show what went wrong, what was going on. So it's a bit of a psychological study. Um, would you call that a historical fiction? It'd be, it would be historical fiction, yeah. biblical historical fiction, which is very hard because everyone knows the characters. Yeah. And so Jesus is a minor character in the story. How do you write a story in which Jesus is a minor character? And everyone has feelings about Jesus. <laughs> so you have to be very carefully how you portray Jesus. Judas has to be, I want people to have a more empathetic view toward him and understand what happened, but still realize and see where it went wrong and say, mm -hmm. you know, Judas, you, you, you really, you got this, you really yeah. stuffed up. But to, but to actually have an understanding of how it happened 
and and think about a lot of bigger issues. And I've had a few people read it so far, and there um, there's been some very good responses, but still some things I need to work mm. on. And I'm 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 not sure what direction to go. I might try, um, you know, maybe a U.S. publisher with that. Okay. As you said, just on the outset before in Australia, just get a bit of wider audience and try that. So that's happening. And then two two. Uh, books on science and faith. One's a historical study of the contribution of Nestorian Christians under the Abbasid dynasty uh, in Baghdad, which is during the golden year of mm -hmm. Islam, uh, that these Nestorian Christians did, had played a great role as physicians and translators as part of that. And that's a largely untold story, so that's a mm. bit of academic work. And another little um, uh, smaller booklet coming out about the influence of monotheism that it played in the role of the rise of science, hmm. which is also a bit of a nun for many. Uh, that, that argument needs to be made to help people see uh, that a bit negative toward religion to see it in perhaps a, a slightly different hmm. matter. So uh, both of those will come out um, uh, as small academic runs, but mm -hmm. you know, hopefully we'll hit their target a bit later this year. So that's in the academic side. Uh, and then on the more the fiction side, the two novellas yeah. that are, one will be about 20,000 words and the other about 30,000. Mm. Uh, the, the, the Winter Fay uh, is um, pretty close and they'll probably start going to production a bit later. Uh, I hope that by the end of the year, uh, it might be so next year, getting uh, Iscariot out, but that's, uh, that's one I'm a bit I'm very passionate about the mm. stories are very, uh, there's a lot of sensitive issues mm. and they're about betrayal and who Jesus is and misunderstandings and suicide, it's all there. And so I want to get it right. So yeah. there's still things I'm thinking, there's still something not quite yep. here missing. So I'm still getting feedback from people looking at it. And when I feel it's right, mm. um, um, we'll, we'll get that out. Wonderful. So that's, that's a couple projects I'm doing currently. And I suppose when those are all done and tidied up, I'll stop and think of what and that's what, and, and writers usually do that as yeah. you would know it's once you you're working working finish something once you finish it you kind of take a breath and you say what am i going to do now yeah. of course the reality <laughs> is sometimes we don't because we've already started thinking about something and started writing so as we're finishing up and editing working on this we're going back and yeah. writing this other thing you, you know what i've got two or three projects started what one am i going to turn my attention to next yeah um mm. becomes the issue wow well, thank you so much for meeting with us today and talking to us about your journey. Well, thank you for uh, asking me to, to be a part of, of this and uh, for doing all the research. I'd say <laughs> right. when I, I saw your questions and your research, I thought, goodness, you know more about me than I do. You should, <laughs> you should interview yourself about me. <laughs> no, it's been wonderful. And um, we look forward to seeing what happens next. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.